It seems like whenever an election comes creeping around, the internet can't help but ask who the cast of King of the Hill would vote for. More specifically, who Hank Hill would vote for. As the protagonist and voice of reason in the show, people on both sides of the aisle claim the propane salesman for their own party. But who would he really vote for this election? Is he team no malarkey or dang old MAGA man? I tell you what, man. <laughs> I just have to do it once. <laughs> that boy ain't right. Now, the problem with trying to find out who Mr. Hill would vote for is that he's a cartoon character on a show that featured a number of different writers during its 13 years on the air. While the underlying motivations for Hank Hill and the rest of the cast remain consistent, their actions are a bit of a mixed bag. In one episode, Hank Hill's unionizing the workers of Megalomart, and in another, he'll be nostalgic about voting for Reagan. He respects Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson while simultaneously discriminating against religious minorities in the hiring process. We're all Christians here. How about you? He's politically scattershot, and if you cherry pick examples from the show, you can basically make a convincing argument for any outcome. Despite this, there is a pretty clear through line to Hank's character. He's old school, culturally conservative, religious, he cares about his family, and in the words of Bobby Hill, Why do you have to hate what you don't understand? Hank Hill is a repressed individual stuck in the turbulent, confusing turn of the millennia, a time where extremes coexisted. We had both an infamously promiscuous president. I did not have <laughs> relations with that woman as well as a rise in Christian fundamentalism. And so every episode has Hank Hill confronting a new form of change. Whether it's hipster gentrifiers, big government, or misandrous feminists, by the end of the episode, Hank has to come to terms with his prejudices and learn that the right answer usually lies somewhere in the middle. For example, in the season two episode, Peggy's Turtle Song, Peggy becomes a stay-at-home mom to support Bobby with his newly diagnosed ADD, which is music to Hank's ears. Over the course of the episode, Peggy picks up guitar lessons and becomes friends with some radical feminists. While performing a song that's a metaphor about how she feels oppressed by her home life, the shell was her home and her prison as well. Hank learns to accept that Peggy just isn't happy without her career, and Peggy turns away from the men-hating feminists and the two find peace in their own middle ground. This formula is what gave the show such immense cultural staying power among people from all political persuasions. And it's not just limited to Twitter discourse and memes. Former Democratic Governor of North Carolina, Mike Easley, based his campaign's messaging off King of the Hill, even going so far as to separate voters into two camps, those who watch the show and those who don't. Its centrist approach to politics made it so appealing to a wide audience that The Atlantic proclaimed it was the last bipartisan TV comedy. But while it could appeal to both liberals and conservatives, it wasn't exactly the even-handed show news outlets would have you believe. King of the Hill was a conservative show through and through. From the very first episode to the last, the show's antagonists are liberal caricatures. Meek paper-pushing bureaucrats, men-hating feminists, crazy environmentalists. And in one of the show's most bizarre episodes, the writers take aim at the American with Disabilities Act, portraying it as an undue burden on businesses that makes workers lazy instead of being, you know, a pretty essential piece of legislation for people with disabilities. While the Hills' conservatism is a far cry from the World War II era machismo and racism of Hank's shinless father, it's not a complete departure. A lot of Hank's patriarchal and authoritarian tendencies go either unchallenged or worse, validated when juxtaposed against the loony liberals that the show presents as the alternatives. A lot of this can be attributed to show creator and voice of Hank Hill himself, Mike Judge. Known for creating hits like Office Space and Idiocracy, Judge has a knack for biting social commentary. But while he claims he doesn't like getting too political with his work, there's a pretty obvious conservative undertone and message throughout his work. He's even gone on the Alex <gasps> Jones show and had this to say. Hello, this is Hank Hill, and I'm telling you what, you need to listen to <laughs> Jones. Okay, I expected that out of Dell, but Hank, come on. If this is canon, then Hank is Team Trump all the way. Thankfully, Judge wasn't the only voice in the writer's room. 
While we have a lot of reasons to suspect that Hank would vote for Trump, overall, Hank Hill sits in an uneasy political middle ground. Take season 5's The Perils of Polling, which is probably as political as the show gets. After experiencing Bush's limp handshake, Hank is mortified. He studies the president's handshake and learns that he's not the man he thought he was. Disillusioned with his hero, he goes so far as to skip the election entirely by driving to Mexico with Dale. Ultimately, it's his sense of civic duty that gets him to race back to the US to cast a ballot, with his decision being left ultimately ambiguous. Applying this episode and the rest of the show's lore to Trump, it's likely Hank would have a similar crisis of faith if he ever met Trump. The 45th is infamous for his horrible handshakes, even the New York Times has written a story on it. And beyond that, Trump has gone on record saying that he likes his steaks well done, which would be a pretty big problem. What if somebody wants theirs well done? We ask them politely yet firmly to leave. Overall, Trump's big city phoniness would ring massive alarm bells in Hank's no-nonsense mind, especially if you watched any of his debates. Okay, Hank, try turning it back on now. Who is Shut your, up, man. Listen, in, in, China ate your lunch, Joe. <gasps> I can say confidently that if Trump ran in the 2000 election, Hank would be repulsed. Okay, future Daniel here, I looked it up, and apparently he did run in 2000 with the Reform Party before dropping out in February, so the more you know. Over the show's 14-year run, the cast remained frozen in time in a pastiche of the late 90s and early 2000s. But we're in the 2020s now, and the simple conservatism of a small-town community isn't quite so simple anymore. Over the decades, stratification among both sides of the aisle has increased dramatically. And if Hank Hill was around today, he would be 67. His politics, like everything else, would transform with the passage of time. And if we're talking demographics, Trump is the clear winner here. Middle class families from small towns in East Texas who have been affected by globalization and immigration are the exact demographic that carried Trump to victory in 2016. On top of this, a big contributor to the rise of Trump has been his ability to tap into deeply rooted dispositions voters have towards themselves and the world around them. A minor but sizable group of voters in the United States have what the philosopher Eric Fromm coined the authoritarian personality. Individuals with this personality type have extreme obedience and respect for authority figures, a submission that has historically been weaponized to oppress minority groups. Researchers have found that a voter's authoritarian tendency is the best predictor on whether they'd vote for Trump in 2016, stronger than race, class, age, gender, and location. In the book The Authoritarian Personality, philosopher Theodore Adorno measures authoritarianism based on an individual's responses to a set of questions, and while it's not exactly a foolproof science, it's a solid basis to determine whether Hank Hill would vote for Trump. And when I was writing the script, I for sure thought Hank wouldn't check enough boxes to be considered an authoritarian personality. Sure, he's traditional, but he's against corporal punishment, he isn't hostile towards minorities, and above all, he's a free thinker, making him a leader, not a follower. But looking at the list and referencing it with his relationship with his boss, Mr. Strickland, a Clinton slash Trump-esque figure, and his son Bobby, the evidence is pretty damning. Blind allegiance to conventional beliefs about right and wrong, submission to acknowledged authority, belief in aggression towards those who do not subscribe to conventional thinking, a belief in simple answers, resistance to creative ideas, a black and white worldview, and a tendency to project one's own feelings of inadequacy onto a scapegoated group. Combined with all the other evidence we have, it's hard to argue that Hank wouldn't be a Trump voter. Maybe he wouldn't be donning the red MAGA hats, but at least his sense of civic duty would keep him from abstaining, and he'd have to swallow any disagreements he might have with the candidate and vote for him anyway. As for Peggy Hill, it's likely that she would follow the patriarch and vote alongside him, just as the majority of white women did in 2016. And as for the rest of the cast outside of Bobby and Luann, it's all but a foregone conclusion. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below.